Okay, now that we're recording, good afternoon. This is the Tuesday, June 21st, 2022 meeting of the Transportation Parking Commission. My name is Donna Lascalia, and I'm the Director of Public Works. I'm also the uh, Chair of the Commission. Um, so we will start by uh, announcing that this meeting is audio and video recorded, um, and I've also enabled the transcription feature at the bottom of the screen. Um, so next, uh, Beth, if you are ready, if you could please call the roll. Donna? Here. You said uh, Jody was going to be out today? Yes, the chief is not with us today. Jamie? Here. Wayne? Here. Nancy? Here. Karen? Here. Jamila? Here. Um, Adam is not here, is that correct? That's correct. And Diana? Here. Okay, thank you, Beth. Okay, next I'll open it up to public comments. If there is any uh, member of the public here who wishes to speak to the commission about something that's not on the agenda, um, you are welcome to do so at this time. If you're here to speak on an agenda item, I just ask you to hold until um, we get to it on the agenda. So is there anyone from the public here who wishes to speak to us? Okay, seeing and hearing none, we'll move on to approval of the minutes from the prior meeting, which was May 17th, 2022. May I have a motion for a positive recommendation, please? Motion to approve. And a second? Second. Second. Okay, thank you. And uh, for discussion purposes, I'll just point out that there was a uh, Scrivener's error on the date in the minutes that were sent to all of us, but that has since been corrected. So there's uh, nothing further we need to do on that. Um, so motion on the floor for a positive recommendation. Is there any further discussion on that? Okay, hearing none, Beth, roll call, please. Donna? Yes. Jamie? Yes. Wayne? Yep. Nancy? Yes. Karen? Yes. Jamila? Yes. And Diana? Yes. Passes unanimously. Thank you, Beth. Okay, next I'll just give a um, few updates from the DPW. So Warner Brothers, who was our paving contractor from last summer is back in town dealing with punch list items on uh, various streets throughout the city. Um, but that project is to be wrapping up shortly. We intend to do a significant amount of pavement preservation this year on West Hampton Road, West Farms Road and the section of Florence Road um, between the town limits and Route 66. Um, we're actually gonna do a very thin uh, pavement surface treatment. So it's just a very thin overlay of asphalt um, that, that we anticipate will uh, increase the service life of the existing roadway by uh, a decade or more. Um, we also have uh, an Eversource contractor in town doing a mill and overlay on a variety of different streets that Eversource has had to dig up for gas line work. So part of uh, the trench permitting process they go through with the city is we require a mill and overlay for restoration in certain areas. So their paving contractor is also mobilized in the city. Um, and of course, there are uh, several ongoing mass DOT projects on King Street, Damon Road and Route 5. And uh, those are under the jurisdiction of, of District 2, Mass DOT. Um, Wayne, do you have anything from your department? I, I do, a couple items. Um, mostly just updates of things I talked about at the last meeting. So the Laurel Street project, which is uh, new sidewalks and, and curbs is all done except for you know, punchless items. The Bridge Street um, bus stop is done except that the new bus stops are bigger than they used to be. So it doesn't quite fit in the site. So we have to deal with that. So we have to do a little bit of work there. Um, we had a last, that, that was a grant PBTA had. Um, we had a last minute grant also from PBTA to add a bus stop on Bridge Road by Prospect. And we just poured the concrete for that yesterday. Um, that's gonna have a shelter. Um, Main Street project in Florence should start construction sometime in early July. So we're getting close. We've already done a couple of things, this new, pedestrian actuated signals, you hear 
the sound, if you're uh, hearing impaired or sight impaired, sorry. Um, Pleasantry project is, I don't know, three quarters, 80% done. Um, so you see the cycle track on one side of the road and, and they begin to work on the other side of the road. The complete streets transition plan, which we presented before you, I think at the last meeting, was just accepted by MassDOT. So that's now efficient in effect and we're able to apply for grants under that. Um, we did get a new shared streets grant, I think since the last time I spoke. Um, and that includes $10,000. During the picture Main Street, we've had a lot of people talk about the need for sheltered bike parking. So we have $10,000 from MassDOT for sheltered bike parking somewhere downtown. We figure out what the right spot is for that. And then some equipment for both line uh, striping and snow removal for the parking division that maintains some of the pedestrian access downtown. Um, May, picture Main Street is moving forward. We're working with DPW and MassDOT on the comment resolution. We're currently projecting a public hearing for that in September. Um, and then related to that, um, we've hired a consultant to help us with parking policy um, because the picture Main Street is bricks and mortar. And we know the most important the parking isn't the number of parking spots, it's the number of vacant spots. So we're looking at the parking policies downtown, particularly in Main Street, on what do we need to do about that? We've had a couple of community forums, one for the public and one for business groups to help move that forward. Um, and then finally, we anticipate the next expansion of Valley Bikes is going to be in 2023, so not for a little while, but we're already beginning to do work as part of that bus stop on Bridge Road. We actually poured the concrete pad for Valley Bike Station while we had a concrete truck there. So it's gonna be empty for a year and a half, but we're ready and we'll be able to figure out what the other two spots are. That's all I have, thanks. Thanks Wayne, appreciate it. Any other members of the commission have any updates for us? Okay, seeing none, uh, we'll move on to matters before the commission. Uh, so next we have uh, trains in the Valley presentation. So Zane Lomelski and Ben Heckscher are here. Um, I hope I uh, pronounced everyone's name correctly and I'm, I'm sorry if I did not. And Ben, you should have screen sharing capabilities. Please let me know if you do not, but I will uh, turn the meeting over to you folks. Thanks. Okay, great. Thank you, Donna. Um, we put together a little presentation here. Um, Let's see, I'll share my screen. Here we go. Um, I'm here with uh, Zane Lomelski. My name's Ben Heckscher. You pronounced it absolutely correct. Um, we are the co-founders of an advocacy group in the region called Trains of the Valley. Um, and what we're gonna do here today is give an overview primarily focused on the passenger rail service that runs through the valley and not the freight rail service, which also runs. If we ever wanted to do that, we could come back. But we're really going to focus on passenger service today. Uh, oh. So to start the presentation, I always like to pick out some nice picture that we took from the past. And this is from 2014 when Amtrak rerouted its Vermonter service through the valley. It was coming up uh, through Palmer and Amherst on the way to Brattleboro, but through a multi-year construction project, they rerouted the service north of Springfield through Holyoke, Northampton and Greenfield. And this is on day one when the governor, Deval Patrick came to visit and basically launched the service uh, for the media and for the elected officials. and. It's, it's difficult to see in this shot because it's lots of backs of heads, but th there are a lot of elected officials there. Uh, and off to the right, you can see people playing brass instruments. Uh, we were serenaded when the train came back to town. Um, Trains of the Valley was founded by Zane and I about six years ago. Uh, we've been focused on this as a group for off and on over the years, even through the pandemic. Uh, we really advocate for improved passenger and freight rail service uh, in the region, the region being the Pioneer Valley. 
Uh, we really don't look at the Berkshires or Central Mass. It's really, we try to stay focused. And if we focus sort of specifically, really the focus is Northampton because that's where the majority of the ridership is. Uh, we've got a very extensive website that you may or may not have seen. I would encourage you to take a look at it if you have interest in this topic. We also have a Facebook page if you want to stay uh, current with what's going on. One of the reasons we started this group was because we were a bit frustrated back in 2015-16 that MassDOT hadn't shared very much information about what was going on with the rebuilding of the rail line in town in the region, the pasture service that was coming, and sort of the projects that were coming uh, down the road. So we, start, we created a website which started collecting that information and sharing it with people. And thanks to Google search, uh, it shows up very high in Google search on all sorts of topics, such if you, if you look uh, for Northampton Station, you'll see it, it comes up relatively quickly. And um, I would say that the vast majority of our website traffic comes from Google search, not from people who just come to the website. We're a founding member of a group called the Western Mass Rail Coalition, which at the moment is a collection of four other advocacy groups, which are primarily focused on East-West Rail, but we, uh, we get together and sort of share notes from time to time to figure out how we can be more effective. And we often like to say, we do what others can't do, won't do, or don't want to do. And, you know, sort of minuscule little things that we often get involved with, as example, in Northampton, the train, the trash cans at the station were overflowing for many months at a time. And it's very difficult sometimes for people to know who's responsible for what in a service that has multiple jurisdictions and oversight. And ultimately we found the path to get that resolved. And now it's not an issue, but you know, sometimes it's difficult for citizens to know who they have to go to to fix something. And we try to be a source for people to come to to try to find a way to get something fixed. Uh, just a, a quick overview here, the rail corridor that runs through Northampton is today owned by MassDOT. It runs from, the state-owned portion runs from Springfield up to the Vermont border. It's known as the Connecticut River Main Line, sometimes just called the Knowledge Corridor. The passenger service is operated by Amtrak. The freight service, which was operated by Pan Am Railways, uh, is now operated effectively by CSX, um, which is a very large national freight company. It's a little more complicated than that, but as I said, we're going to go into freight today. Uh, the funding source for both capital improvements on the rail corridor and the operating subsidy for the passenger rail service is provided by MassDOT. Today, we have uh, a round trip service that operates between Washington and Northern Vermont called the Vermonter. As you may know, this comes through Vermont, sorry, comes through Northampton uh, in the mid afternoon. We also have a new, relatively new service called the Valley Flyer, which uh, starts in Greenfield in the morning with two southbound runs down to New Haven for people to connect with Amtrak service and importantly Metro North service onto New York City and Washington DC. And then in the evening, that service operates north from New Haven back up to Holyoke, Northampton and Greenfield. This might be a little bit difficult to see on your screens, but this is sort of, this is a sort of detailed overview of the service that's available uh, out of Northampton. It's basically a schedule. And this is an example of the kind of stuff that we do that other people don't do. Amtrak doesn't publish timetables anymore. They've decided that, you know, the world can get by without timetables and they can do everything online. We decided that a uh, timetable is useful for people to have in a paper format or on the screen that they can look at. And this basically shows the connections that are possible as you read down from the top from Northampton, you get on the train to New Haven, you can connect there to an Amtrak service or to Metro North. And I won't go into any kind of this detail because it's probably very difficult to see on many screens, uh, but you can find this timetable on our website or even on the platform in Northampton, you can, there's a folded copy there that people can pick up and we go through about 50 to 75 timetables each month on the platform. The station platform in Northampton, a little overview that the platform's owned by MassDOT, the tracks are owned by MassDOT. Uh, importantly though, the, all of the parking at the station is privately owned. 
Uh, it's owned by an entity called Harmonic Rock LLC. This is, these are the owners of the Union Station building. Uh, this presents a little bit of challenge at times because uh, this, there's sort of the tug of war that goes on. I shouldn't call it a tug of war. There's a give and take over what the parking is going to be used for. People uh, can access the lots at any time free of charge to uh, drop people off at the platform and pick people up. But parking can sometimes be constrained when there's a wedding or a large event at Union Station. Um, and you know some of the parking is not available at the moment because of the outdoor tents that are set up at the station, uh, in the parking lot actually at Union Station. So it's a little bit, it works, but at, at the same time it works, it sometimes doesn't work. But it, you know, as some would say, it's better than nothing. Um, this is an overview of the last six years of ridership uh, through Greenfield, Holyoke, and Northampton. Uh, without going into too much detail here, it's basically been growing. It was growing 10% per year out of Northampton until COVID came. Uh, the Vermonter was suspended for about a year or a little bit over a year. The Valley Flyer continued to operate. Um, both services are now back up and running and uh, ridership has basically returned, if not uh, improved, I would say, with the gas prices where they are. And what we're, what's interesting that we're seeing with the Valley Flyer service now, there are days now when the Valley Flyer, uh, we have service carry more passengers on the southbound runs than the Vermonter carries, which shows uh, that there is a growing amount of ridership on both the Valley Flyer and the Vermonter as a whole. So more people are taking the train because there are more trains available and the schedule provides more options for people. Now, as I mentioned, the Valley Flyer is in what MassDOT calls a pilot phase. And the pilot phase is uh, a term that MassDOT uses for a service that is offered for a period of time. And if it's proved to be effective, it's continued. And if it's not effective, then it's not continued. It's sort of like that. And what we are advocating for when we come out of the pilot phase is that we get a better schedule for the Valley Flyer on the northbound runs. Uh, anyone who's taken the train or looked at the schedules knows that uh, the northbound trains come back pretty late at night. Uh, they arrive either at about 10 o'clock or after midnight into Northampton. They arrive closer to 1230 in the morning in Greenfield. Um, Anyone who's taken the train knows that it has to actually back in and back out of the station in Springfield. This can be fixed with a project that MassDOT is starting to design now to reconfigure the tracks at Union Station in Springfield. And we're also very importantly looking at what well, we would like to see improvements made to the fare structure. The fare structure at the moment that Amtrak uses is, is basically a dynamic fare pricing which is similar to what the airlines do. If you want to take the train tomorrow, the trains can be really quite expensive. If you want to, if you book in advance, you've got a lower price. Um, in this chart here, which is again, rather complicated, but it's got lots of detail. If you read from the left is the origin and the two destination is on the top. If you're traveling from Northampton to New Haven on the Valley Flyer, it's $34. If you take that same trip from Springfield, it's $13. We don't see any particular reason or that it makes sense that the price out of Northampton is three times the price effectively as the price out of Springfield. And that's not gonna help for ridership within the knowledge quarter or within the, uh, the full quarter between Greenfield and New Haven. You can see everything that's in blue here are prices that are set by the Connecticut Department of Transportation for a service called the Hartford Line. Everything that's in yellow here are fares, are really inner city fares that have been set by Amtrak. And um, this, was, this was done really because uh, the initial plan was that this was for an intercity service to help people to get to New York City. But we would like to see added on to that is the possibility for regional travel, say to Springfield or to Hartford or to New Haven or any of those stops in between. But if you tell someone that it's going to be uh, $20 uh, to get to, Har to Hartford, but it's only $6 from Springfield, people aren't going to do it. We, we even know people today that use the PBTA to get to Springfield, and then they get on the train, the same train that left New Northampton, 
in Springfield so they can save 20 bucks. Um, it just doesn't make sense. And this is one of the things that we are starting to advocate for now through, with our legislators uh, to get a better fare structure for the Valley Flyer when we come out of the pilot phase. Another service that's coming down in a, a few years, which will be the extension of the Vermonter service into Montreal. Many of you who've lived in the region for a while probably know there used to be a train called the Montrealer that came through the city in the middle of the night. Uh, it was an overnight train to Montreal and to New York and Washington. Uh, there has been a, a decade long effort to try to get the Vermonter extended across the border. Uh, it's pretty difficult post 9-11 to do that kind of stuff. But basically where it stands now is they need to, they being the uh, authorities up in Canada and Quebec, need to be what's called a pre-clearance facility at Montreal Central Station. So when the train arrives in the station, you'll go through customs, US customs and immigration in the station of Montreal and then step into Canada. And the same will be true. You'll go through US customs in Montreal step on the train and you'll go basically straight to the United States from there. There's also some track up upgrades that are needed, but this is still probably a couple of years away. Um, so why is rail, passenger rail important in Northampton? From our perspective, it provides people with uh, a means to travel through longer distances and they don't need a personal car. Um, it provides easy access or convenient access to major cities, New York City in particular right now, Montreal in a few years, and Boston with East West Rail. Um, it's a more climate friendly way to get around. And importantly, it also provides a means for access to Bradley Airport. We haven't, most of you know, we haven't had any kind of public transport means to get to Bradley for many years since Peter Pan took their bus, uh, bus uh, route that they used to have to Bradley off. There is, it is possible now actually to take the Valley Flyer down to Windsor Lock Station and connect with a CT Transit bus that goes directly to Windsor Locks. And when they rebuild the station of Windsor Locks or in the new location in a couple of years, there'll be every train will be met by a bus to get to and from the airport. So there won't be the need to always drive um, out to the airport, down to the airport. You'll be able to take a train. And I actually tested this out myself um, and when I did it, I found two people who were also going to the airport on the Valley Flyer. And I asked them, they were from Denver, I asked them, how in the world did you find out that the service existed? And they said, we just went to Google Maps, switched to transit mode, and this came up as the first option. And that's what they did. So it shows that, you know, that it, people can't figure out how to use public transit. And our, part of our role is just how can we make that easier for people to use. And finally, the last point I'll mention is, you know, having a service such as the Valley Flyer and the Vermonter coming through the city, you know, provides an attractiveness to Northampton and the surrounding community, communities as a place to live, visit, and work. It puts us, you know, more on the map. It makes us easier to get around. And it helps people, you know, who don't want to drive long distances to basically use forms of public transport to get around rather than just driving. And we think that's a good thing. Uh, last page I'll just mention here for, for additional information. I'd recommend you look at their website. Uh, we have information. Uh, these are some links, and I guess the presentation could be circulated. But there's information, of course, about the station, about the Valley Flyer, the Vermonter, infrastructure projects that are coming down the road in the coming months and the coming years. And importantly, we have a dedicated page about the Route 9 railroad underpass in Northampton, which gets hit by uh, trucks. And this is an example of the kind of thing we do that nobody else does. We have a dedicated page just on this topic with basically everything you'd ever want to know about trucks hitting the overpass in downtown Northampton and what could be done about it if there was ever money to raise the overpass, which was built in 1890. So with that, I'll just leave it at that. I'll stop sharing my screen. And if there are any questions, uh, Sandy and I would be happy to take them. Thank you so much for a really informative uh, presentation. Uh, I, it, it was great. Um, I'll ask if uh, anyone on the commission has any comments for Ben or Zane. Uh, I will, I'll, I'll just add one thing. Um, you probably, a lot of you know this. This is a very seminal time for rail 
transportation in the United States. And uh, there are a lot of projects on the works that uh, are get, getting funded. It may take a while, but um, there's a tremendous amount of activity. And uh, you know, our elected officials are working on it and, and so are the uh, transportation officials. Thanks, Ann. I'll add that I'm a fan of the Vermonter. I live north of the border, and um, and and so very familiar with that service. So um, uh, appreciate the uh, appreciate that connectivity for sure. Just one Anyone? of the infrastructure one of the infrastructure projects is Brattleboro. It's also getting a new station starting next year. It definitely needs it. It's um, there, <laughs> there's there's quite a bit of congestion in that area, and yeah. um, I, I think it's a little bit of a lifeline for for folks, you know, north of the border to to get to the larger cities in the south, and um, a lot of uh, congestion and kind of an open platform, and the weather's um, you know difficult. Uh, so, yeah. so definitely a, a a great project. Donna, what station do you go to in Vermont? Brattleboro. Okay. Great. Construction will be fun, I'm sure. Yeah. Anyone else on the commission have any uh, comments uh, before we move on for Ben or Zane? I'll make one quick comment. Uh, first of all, very much appreciate the work you, you guys are doing on this. It's a uh, really important uh, work for the region, I believe. Um, when, when that um, connecting bus is in place, how long do you see transit time from Northampton to the airport being? Um, ideally, if they fix the tracks in Springfield, it could be as quickly as 45 minutes. Um, okay. But at the moment, the train's got to go down and back in the station. It's got to sit there and wait. Then it's got to get the winter locked and then you make the bus connection. But the bus to the airport is only about 11, 12 minutes. Yeah. So it's pretty fast. It's, it's viable once they get that in place, then it sounds like. Yeah. Well, and it's very valuable, especially if you don't have a car. The people that from Denver didn't have access to a car. And for them, it was their way to get there without taking a taxi, basically, or an Uber. Yeah, very good. Thank you. Hey, we've got one hand. Uh, we'll unmute you, Elena. Hold on just a moment. Hi, thanks so much. Um, I know I'm not on the commission, but um, fascinating presentation. Um, I just had a question about the East-West Rail. I know there's been a lot of chatter about it in the state lately. And I think I saw, was reading earlier today that Ways and Means Committee earmarked 250 million or something of the sort to further along feasibility and things of that nature, but I was just curious from your perspective if you had any updates on on that particular rail line. Let, let's just say there's a lot of moving parts right now with that, uh, in part thanks to the governor. Uh, the news update really from today, as you noted, is that there is a, uh, a, a bill in the House that's going to shortly be up for vote, which includes $250 million marked for use for East West Rail, which will be matched against federal funds that will be applied for in a competitive grant uh, from the federal infrastructure bill. Um, and separately, there apparently in the bill, there's also a commission that's going to be established to decide what the best form of governance will be to manage East West Rail, meaning whether it will be managed by MassDOT or whether it will be managed by what some are calling the Western Massachusetts Rail Authority. That hasn't been decided. It's only in the House version of the bill. Um, but the fact that the text is there would suggest that it might move forward, meaning the bill. So, I mean, it's, it's there's a lot happening and we're probably gonna hear a lot more before the end of the session at the end of July. Uh, I'm, I'm just gonna note, most people don't know this, but there already is a train to Boston. Um, yes. It's uh, the Lakeshore, Lakeshore Limited, which is a, a very long train. If you're going from Boston to Springfield, it's usually on time. It's a great ride. It's not that it's long. Here. But it's if great. you going the other direction, it starts in Chicago and could be 8, 10, 12 hours late. In the worst case. <laughs> in the worst case, right. In the winter. But it, it exists. 
But the final point I'll just say about this one, East West Rail, there's a lot of momentum now, I would say, for this to move forward. How long it'll take is not clear at the moment, but there's incredible support from the Western Mass delegation, representatives, senators, members of Congress, you know, to use uh, saying everybody's on board and pushing for this. Uh, and when we get a new governor, I think there'll be even more momentum to push this forward. All of the stars are aligned for this to actually happen. And now we just need the political will to sort of push it over the finish line. And that's there, I think. Okay, thank you. Any other members of the commission have any final comments for Ben and Zane? Okay, so again, thank you so much for your time and, and a really crisp and informative presentation. So um, and my compliments uh, and our compliments on, on great work and thank you so much for joining us this afternoon. Thank you. Okay, take care. All right, next up we have a proposed ordinance relative to stop signs on Ford Crossing and Olander Drive. Uh, so I will read the proposed ordinance. In the year 2022, upon the recommendation of the Transportation Parking Commission, an ordinance relative to stop signs on Ford Crossing and Orland Olander Drive. An ordinance of the City of Northampton, Massachusetts, be it ordained by the City Council of the City of Northampton and City Council assembled as follows. Section 1, that Section 312-113 of the Code of Ordinances be amended as follows. Section 312-113, Schedule 12, Stop and Yield Intersections. A, isolated stop signs. Stop intersections are established at the following locations. I will skip the dates. Location, Ford Crossing, direction of travel east at the intersection of Olander Drive. Location, Olander Drive, direction of travel north the intersection of Ford Crossing. May I have a motion for a positive recommendation, please? Donna, can I just, for the record, I live one long block away, so I'm removing myself for potential conflict of interest. Thank you, Wayne. Move a positive recommendation. Okay, may I have a second, please? Second. Okay, so by way of discussion, uh, this ordinance proposes new stop signs on Ford Crossing and Olander Drive. This intersection has three approaches. Um, one of the approaches is Olander Drive extension, which is a new development. So this is um, you know, part of sort of the ongoing development of Village Hill and as uh, housing units have been constructed and they are now occupied, um, we find increased uh, traffic flows and some of these intersections, as the commission may recall, um, have been studied um, in, in the uh, near past. Um, and it has been determined that, uh, you know, there are restricted sight lines from, uh, you know, combination of vegetation or, or parked vehicles. Um, and this intersection absolutely falls in that category. And, and there are, um, you know, more cars uh, than, than certainly there had been, you know, a, a year ago um, approaching this intersection. So to reduce the potential for conflicts, um, we are proposing the installation of the stop signs. You will note that this is um, actually a three-way intersection. We're only proposing two stop signs because Orlando Drive Extension is actually private. Um, so I believe that Councilor Foster will be good enough to work with the neighborhood group there to, um, to actually install a stop signs. This is very similar to uh, Higgins Way, which we voted on uh, a few months back, but I just want to explain why the ordinance is written as it is, the configuration of the intersection. That's the rationale. Um, is there any discussion among or questions from uh, anyone on the commission on this? Okay, seeing and hearing none. Councillor Foster, go ahead. Sorry, I was looking for the raise hand feature and um, excuse the delay. So yeah, I just wanted to say I did some outreach at Village Hill um, and you know, there, there definitely was probably about two thirds of the responses I got back were um, in favor and appreciative um, of the idea of the city placing stop signs um, on those two sides on Ford Crossing and on Olander um, heading north. Um, there were, a couple of people who were concerned that that maybe there's not enough traffic to warrant, but overall, um, you know, the responses were positive um, in favor, and, and including um, the folks that live 
right at the corner there um, and have poor visibility for getting out of their driveway. Um, so with, with the increased traffic, which isn't shown on the map, um, it was something that, that seems to make sense with the other intersections of Village Hill. So I appreciate you bringing this forward. Thanks, Councilor. Any other comments? Um, could you help me understand? Um, I certainly understand the stop sign at Ford Crossing. I don't quite understand the one northbound on Olander and what is that trying to achieve? So what we're trying to do here is it hold people who may be turning left um, onto Ford Crossing um, coming up Olander um, because if someone's coming out of Olander Drive extension, that's a potential for conflict. So it, what we have to be careful of um, and we run into this in a lot of intersections around the city when you control traffic, uh, not in all directions, um, people can become confused um, I, about does cross traffic stop, does cross traffic not stop. Sometimes we actually have to put signs up that says cross traffic does not stop. Um, in this case, what we're going for is consistency within the neighborhood. So um, where we just passed a, a whole bucket of ordinances um, installing stop controls at various intersections in Village Hill. What we're trying to do is create consistent ordinances throughout this entire neighborhood so that people are not confused um, and that they see a stop control when they expect one. So that's the rationale for this. Okay, thank you. Any other comments or questions on this? Go ahead, Councillor Foster. Uh, I just wanted to, I, I don't want to put her on the spot, but Julia Scannell from the Community Builders, which um, has the 53 unit um, development North Commons, it's not shown on our map, is here. So just wanted to say that in, in case you wanted to speak. Okay, Julia, do you, do you have um, something you'd like to add to this discussion? You're uh, welcome to, uh, to join us here. Uh, I, no, I'm, I'm supportive of all, all Karen's work here and we've worked together. Um, the Olander Drive extension is, is private and, and owned by the ownership for the North Commons at Village Hill property that the community builders owns. So, um, you know, we've been working together with the community and Karen on this effort and um, uh, glad, to, glad to see this happening. Okay, thanks for your comments, appreciate it. Okay, thanks, Councillor, for letting us know Julia was here. Okay, any further discussion on this proposed ordinance? Okay, Wayne has recused himself from this vote. Uh, so Beth, when you're ready, uh, we have a motion for a positive recommendation on the floor. Please call the roll. Donna? Yes. Jamie? Yes. Uh, Nancy? Yes. Karen? Yes. Jamila? Yes. Diana? Yes. So that's six yeses and one abstention. Motion passes. Thank you, Beth. Okay, next up, we have a discussion of an accessible uh, of accessible parking on New South Street and Keith Benoya is here with us. Keith? Uh, go ahead. Uh, thank you. Um, yeah, so um, the um, one of the residents at 22 through 34 in the South Street Apartments, uh, they approached um, their uh, property management um, and really at, and uh, asked to have an accessible apartment spot on New South Street. Right now, um, those a new South or South Street apartments. Um, there they have no park dedicated parking, um, and on that side of the, the street, New South Street that they're on, there is no parking period. And on the opposite side, so the old DA Sullivan School um, opposite of Academy of Music, um, there is no accessible parking whatsoever. Um, the closest accessible parking uh, would be in the roundhouse lot. Previously, the closest one was at Peter Pan, but with the new uh, redevelopment of the parking spot, there's actually several, um, but they'd have to uh, go up the ramp through Pulaski Park um, and then over to the building. 
Um, so it's quite um, quite a challenge just to get to the accessible parking spot. Um, and so one one resident did request this, but um, uh, we just the city just gave um, uh, the apartment complex uh, eighty three thousand dollars in CPG funding to redevelop uh, all those units, and three of them are accessible. Um, so there are there is more than one person in that building that uh, has accessibility issues. Um, so the request is really just to uh, kind of put in one accessible parking spot closest to the mid block crossing on New South Street. Um, and you know it's important that to know that someone with an accessible parking placard, they can park in any spot in the city. Um, it doesn't need to be an accessible parking spot, but those parking spots are high value. And, uh, finding one that you need, um, you know, when you come home from work or whatever it is, it's, it's very challenging. So having that kind of reserved spot uh, on the South Street would, would be great. Okay, thank you, Keith. Anyone have any uh, comments or questions about this? Uh, Councillor Foster, go ahead. It's just a, a clarification. I think you had mentioned there were there was more than than one person living there with mobility needs, and I'm just wondering, will the one spot meet the needs of the residents there? I I should say that three three of the, the units are accessible. Um, I, I don't know if the people have mobility impairments or other things. Um, but the request, at least from the property management, was one one spot. Um, yeah. And and with the main street redesign, uh, and with conversations with the disability commission, um, and other conversations we've had, you know, um, losing parking spaces and, and losing any um, accessible parking spaces um, or moving them around. Uh, has been a, a source of contention. Uh, this, you know, this is not really to serve that kind of downtown commercial core, but it's really to service uh, the social departments. I'll, uh, I'll comment that that mid block crosswalk um, is a uh, difficult spot for us. Um, we have a hard time controlling traffic through that corridor and uh, discouraging folks from not creating two lanes inbound there. Um, and that uh, definitely has the uh, potential to create uh, pedestrian uh, conflicts and, and pedestrian car conflicts in that crosswalk. Um, which can certainly apply to um, anyone using it. Um, so I'll I'll just add that that this is kind of a troublesome corridor for us uh, already, and just something that we should keep in the back of our heads that um, further safety improvements may be warranted here in, in the future. Um, and in the meantime, you know, I, I guess we have to determine if if we feel it's warranted. Um, to carve out, you know, one or potentially more uh, spots, you know, across the street, um, knowing that this is a tricky passage corridor here. So I, I just want to, I just want to add that, and I'm sure the property managers are are aware of that. Um, but I, I just want to be clear that that any uh, modification to that crosswalk or to that roadway is a more long term conversation um, and. And if we were uh, to, you know, if this commission were to decide we want to move forward with creating an accessible space here, that um, would not mean that we would be able to make sort of instantaneous um, safety improvements to the stretch. Any other comments on this from anyone? Councillor Gore, go ahead. I just have a question. Um, where exactly on South Street would the parking space go?
I was, I was proposing, uh, if you're looking at street view, it would be the so be the west side, so opposite of the Academy of Music, and uh, right it looks like 35 New South Street. Uh, that's the building number. It's a little white placard in front, so it's the closest to that mid block intersection in the um, the driveway into that parking lot back there. So headed outbound from cool. downtown, you, you would want to take that last spot. From a DPW perspective, um, we are typically neutral on matters around parking. Um, for us, we look at safety considerations um, around, you know, is the roadway wide enough? What does the visibility look like? Um, the you know, transforming a uh, parking space from a regular parking space into a, um, uh, a placarded space, we would want to look um, to see what we have for ramps or accommodation um, for uh, someone in a wheelchair to get into that um, uh, mid block crosswalk. So that's something we would have to do, but a larger picture, um, you know, that's more of a decision that would go with. Um, the parking enforcement folks, um, and, as well as the mayor's office as well. But um, that's the purpose of having the discussion within this commission to determine if we feel we should move forward to in engagement with those folks as, as next steps. Any other comments on this? So our next steps will be that we will assess um, whether we feel like it's it's viable to fulfill this request. Um, and then we will confer with the mayor's office. Um, and uh, has the Disability Commission discussed this, Keith? Uh, yes, uh, I believe we're looking at the letter that they, um, that they wrote and signed uh, and was sent to you all um, uh, last year, late last year. Okay. All right, so we will um, we will take a look at this from an engineering perspective and and make sure that there's no conflicts um, by, on on that end. Um, and again, uh, confer with the mayor's office. Um, and if we decide to move forward, we will bring an ordinance back to this commission. Okay. Any other Any. comments on this? Okay, hearing none, we'll move on to a proposed ordinance relative to parking on Prospect Street. I'll read the ordinance in the year 2022 upon the recommendation of the Transportation and Parking Commission, an ordinance relative to parking on Prospect Street. An ordinance of the City of Northampton, Massachusetts, be it ordained by the City Council of the City of Northampton and City Council, assembled as follows. Section 1. That Section 312-102 of the Code of Ordinances be amended as follows. Section 312-102, Schedule 1. Parking prohibited all times. Location, Prospect Street, side northeast from Stoddard Street to a point 65 feet northwesterly of Stoddard Street. May I have a motion for a positive recommendation, please? Move Anyone? a positive recommendation. Thank you, Councillor. May I have a second, please? Second. second. Okay, Beth, did you get who seconded that? Because I didn't. You were both speaking at once. I did, but somebody else did as well. I'm not sure. I, I thought I heard Nancy, but it, they did happen about the same time. All right, we'll give it to Wayne since it's his last meeting. <laughs> Thanks, Wayne. Okay, by way of discussion, um, this we have uh, uh, just passed uh, or we have just discussed um, parking restrictions on Stoddard Street. Um, the residents there, uh, as part of uh, the process that we engaged in with them, have pointed out that there is um, a sort of poor visibility uh, at this intersection. So we are proposing a 65 foot parking restriction on the northeast side of Prospect Street, starting at Stoddard Street and headed northwest. So Prospect Street is approximately 40 feet wide at this intersection. There are several parking restrictions on Prospect Street. At this location, parking is prohibited on the east side from Stoddard Street 
uh, for about 75 feet. There's an existing painted crosswalk across Prospect Street. And what happens is a vehicle is sometimes parked between the crosswalk and Stoddard Street. Um, what this parking restriction aims to do is improve visibility of pedestrians and sight lines turning off of Stoddard onto Prospect. So what happens is a lot of time there's a car sort of wedged in between the street and that crosswalk. And, you know, no one can see the pedestrian in the crosswalk because they're being blocked for like the first 10 feet by this car. So that is what this ordinance seeks to do. This entire uh, corridor on Prospect Street is something that we're looking at. Um, is a pretty traffic, uh, heavy traffic flow through there, um, moving it uh, at sometimes high rates of speed. So this is one of a series of improvements that, that we are potentially looking at. Um, and this should uh, go a ways towards at least opening up that crosswalk so everyone can, can see when there's somebody in it. That's the explanation for this. Any questions or discussion? Okay, Nancy, go ahead. On the opposite side of the road, the round hill roadside, why don't we have something there also? Which side you're talking about headed? On the opposite side. Okay, so before the crosswalk on exactly. that side? There are bike lanes, existing bike lanes on that side. So you're not supposed to park in those bike lanes already. Thank you. Any this is an aerial photo from 2014. So the bike lanes aren't shown here. Oh, before the bike lanes. Thanks, Maggie. Yep. Okay, any other uh, comments? Councillor Gore, go ahead. Um, I think this is, I think this is good for this intersection is particularly dangerous for uh, pedestrians. I think it's, it can be like the, the visibility of that crosswalk can be really um, obscured a lot of times, especially by people coming from uh, town to down Prospect Street because there's a little bit of a curve. So um, I think this is a really good improvement to that. Uh, intersection. Thank you, Councillor. Yeah, we, we always want to try to open the crosswalks up. So this is, thank you. Any other comments on this, questions? Okay, seeing and hearing none, we have a motion for a positive recommendation for this on the floor. Beth, please call the roll. Donna? Yes. Jamie? Yes. Wayne? Yes. Nancy? Yes. Karen? Yes. Jamila? Yes. Diana? Yes. That's unanimous with seven yeses. Thank you, Beth. Next up is discussion of a parking request for Market Street. This was submitted to us on December 7th of 2021. Resident called to report there is no handicapped parking on Market Street near Joe's Pizza and other business. The request is that a handicapped parking space be designated in this area. A couple of engineering notes. Market Street's approximately 1,500 feet long. Uh, ranges between 28 and 36 feet wide, so quite narrow, and connects Bridge Street and North Street. There are several existing parking regulations on the street um, that of note is that Market Street has 20 painted parallel parking spaces. Um, so the request would be to take one of those and turn it into a uh, handicapped spot. I don't know if anyone uh, has any comments on this. I see that Councillor Nash is not with us this afternoon, um, but uh, and just want to uh, sort of have a public discussion around this or see what the commission's uh, thoughts are on this. You know, Keith is still with us, and I'll have to put you on the spot. Keith, um, uh, just throw it out there for discussion if anyone has any comments. Uh, I mean, I have something to add. Uh, yeah, I mean, a lot, you know, a lot of what I've been learning with talking with this village commission is 
is just the, the length uh, or the distance required to travel from, say, an accessible parking spot to something you want to go to. And you might, it might be something you really enjoy, uh, but the decision is made that it's the, the burden is too much to go from that spot to. So, you know, if it, there's not a market steer right now, the, the next one is going to be um, either under the bridge or kind of past um, Fitzwillies up there. Um, so it's quite a long distance. Um, and, you know, there's there's not just Joe's, there's the hair salon, there's the bookshop, um, even uh, some of those other, other businesses kind of closer to um, the roost. Um, so I'm pretty sure this commission would be in favor. And uh, if, if you all want to talk to them, I'm sure uh, they would be more than happy to talk about it. But um, knowing nothing else, I would be in support of this. Thanks, Keith. So as as I mentioned with um, the request on New South Street, you know we would we would want to kind of take a look at the curb configuration and see where it might make the most sense. Um, we we don't want to create uh, unsafe scenarios for anyone, and and you know like if we don't have a curb cut, for example, or or some sort of curb ramp. Um, so we do uh, need to take a look at it from an engineering perspective. Um, any other members of the commission have any comments? Diana, go ahead. I just had a question. When we're making a parallel parking spot into an accessible spot, is there anything to that as far as the configuration of it, or is it just having a requirement that a person have a placard to park there? Any requirement from an engineering perspective, you mean? Yeah, like when, when we're talking about about making a parallel parking spot into a disabled access parking spot? Are, are we changing the spot or is that something that's accomplished purely just through a sign? It's accomplished through a sign, but we would not want to uh, create that spot in an area where there was not um, immediate access to a curb ramp. Gotcha. Thank you. Councilor Foster. Yeah, I, um, my thought process aligns very similarly to Keith's and, and just interestingly last night I was talking with a Northampton resident um, who uses a wheelchair, who was saying like she wants to be able to go out and enjoy the businesses and the bookstore and the restaurants and all of the reasons she moved here. Um, and gets frustrated when there are those kinds of structural barriers in her way so to Keith's point if there's not an accessible spot on that section of Market Street, that would be quite a distance um, for somebody if they need to park on Main Street um, or consider crossing. So if it can be done from an engineering perspective, I would definitely be in favor um, of, of putting one there. Thank you, Councilor. Anyone else have any comments? I think that, as I mentioned, Councillor Nash is not here, um, but uh, given the um, sort of the lack of parking along this street, um, one of the things that I think would be necessary is some outreach to businesses um, and uh, maybe the Disability Commission can take a look at this and make a recommendation uh, back to us uh, prior to us moving forward um, it, as I mentioned, um, wearing my DPW director hat uh, from an engineering perspective, we have to make sure that that there is a curb ramp um, that that is immediately available, but um, we are neutral on who parks where. Um, we, we just need to confirm that it's appropriate to park somewhere. So um, this can have implications for businesses, though, um, which is typically why we do um, community outreach, um, and we do that through the Disability Commission, through the Mayor's Office, and through the City Councilor. So those would be the next steps for this request. Um, so Keith, will um, we will be in touch about that, and we'll also be in touch with uh, Councilor Nash, and we will share with them the comments um, that have been made uh, by the Commission. Anyone else have any comments on this matter? Okay, Brett, I see your hand up. I'll unmute you. Go ahead. 
Maybe that was an accident and I'm not sure. Aha, uh -huh. thank you. Sorry. Yeah. Um, uh, I would just want to say that you mentioned that there would be uh, consequences for to the businesses. And I, I just wanted to say that it sounded like you probably didn't intend this, but it sounded like you were mainly speaking about negative consequences. And we had just heard how there would be positive consequences for a larger clientele group. So I just wanted to make that clear that there is potential for that growth, as well as the possibility that the spot will sit empty sometimes when otherwise it would have been filled. Thanks. Yep, thanks for your comments. Yep, and and my comment is that um, there are a variety of constituencies um, who will require outreach for something like this, um, as with the spot on New South Street and as with any uh, parking changes that we make. Um, so those constituencies um, require outreach, um, again, from the mayor's office and the city councilor, um, and those are businesses, residents on the street, um, and as well as other commissions within the city um, so that everybody can express their interest um, in, in how we move forward. So um, that's the, uh, the crux of my comments. So thank you, Brett. Um, okay, any further discussion on this? Okay, hearing none, we'll move on to discussion of parking request for Locust Street. And so this was submitted to us on January 28th, 2022. The concern is that it is uh, very difficult to see oncoming traffic from Florence Center when cars are parked in front of the two houses near the corner of Straw Ave and Locust Street. When multiple cars are parked in a row there, uh, it, it blocks uh, the, these oncoming cars. Um, the request is a possible no parking area in front of 277 Locust Street to the phone pole before 279 Locust Street. So from an engineering perspective, Locust Street between Berkshire Terrace and South Main Street is approximately 670 feet long and 40 feet wide. There is an eight foot parking lane on the north side of the street and parking is not allowed on the south side due to the bike lane. So those are some engineering notes. Um, I am not sure if anyone uh, from public is here to speak to this um, and I know the counselor is not with us uh, this afternoon. So um, I don't know if anyone on the commission has any comments on this. Um, it's certainly something we can internally review. We never want to see uh, bad sight lines at, at any intersection. Um, but if anyone has any comments from this, you're welcome to, uh, on this, you're welcome to share them with us. Diana, go ahead. Um, just that that corner right there, I have a concern um, with the parking, particularly as it relates to the pedestrian crossing on Route 9. Um, it seems like there's kind of a crest of a hill and the traffic coming out of Florence Center is coming very fast and doesn't see pedestrians maybe as, as quickly as they do kind of more inside of Florence Center. So, um, you know, I don't know if if eliminating those parking spots would would help that, but um, it, it seems like it might. I know that is for all of the Route 9 crossings, I'm, I'm always skittish about unsignaled pedestrian crossings. And um, I do see cars flying by there all the time. Um, and, you know, people trying to stop and wait and having to wait a long time for cars. So that just seemed like it might be something to, to think about. Okay. Thank you for that comment. Appreciate it. Okay. Elena, go ahead. Hold on, we're having trouble unmuting you. Great, thank you. Can you hear me? Yep, go ahead. Um, so I live nearby and live in the neighborhood um, in this particular crosswalk. I just wanted to echo Diana's comments around cars driving particularly fast, leaving Foreign Center and traveling down Route 9. Um, even when cars will stop on the opposite side of the street, I oftentimes have to wait several speeding cars um, to pass before it's safe for me to start itching, inching my way into the street to cross safely. Um, and then it's a really complicated intersection because oftentimes there's cars leaving Straw, Straw Avenue um, or Berkshire Terrace. And so 
I would also echo that the sight lines, if you're in a vehicle leaving Berkshire Terrace is really challenging to see because of that hill that's coming um, from Florence. So um, it doesn't sound like there's gonna be a decision made today on this particular one, but I would um, echo what Diana was saying and just add that it is a really challenging intersection to navigate both as a pedestrian, um, cyclist and a car driver. Okay, thank you for those comments. Go ahead, Diana. And just to raise a point that I forgot, um, because this is uh, very near my neighborhood, um, I'm not sure what the accident history is there, but I know that we've observed a few accidents in the last maybe six, eight months at this intersection as well. Um, you know, one of them was, it, it looked like it was a rear ender and it was the exact same kind of accident situation that we were talking about. It was cars coming out of Florence down route nine, one stopped for a pedestrian and the other one rear ended. And it, it looked like it was a fairly severe for a fender bender. So that's all. Okay. Thank you for pointing that out. Yeah. And, and no action will be taken on this today. It's a, this is meant more as a, a discussion for the commission and anyone from the public who's here who wishes to speak um, about this particular intersection. So those comments are helpful. Um, and what I would propose we do is uh, pull the accident data for this area. Uh, and also take a little bit of a closer look at this and see it, you know, obviously it, it's not a signalized crossing, but, you know, maybe we can uh, take a look at opening up the sight lines here, um, which, which always helps and, and um, rarely hurts. Um, so that would be my proposed path forward on this. Does anyone else have any other comments? Brett, go ahead. Thank you. Um, I've been talking about this intersection for years um, in the pedestrian uh, bicycle subcommittee and uh, other places in life. Um, it's definitely a problem. And this one issue is probably not the most important. Probably the most important that hasn't been addressed yet is the speed limit. It's a 40 mile an hour speed limit through a crosswalk, which is a problem. But today's issue is about the sight lines from Straw Ave and I do support removing at least one parking space to make those sight lines better. I would hesitate to say without the outreach that you've mentioned before on other issues, whether we would take two or not, but definitely one. I don't, I'd have to see measurements and whatnot. Um, I would, the only other thing I wanted to mention was that this is also a, uh, it's on a bus line and buses turn into Straw Ave, but I've seen it where they can't turn into Straw Ave because the cars are inching so far out because they can't see to make the left-hand turn downhill out of Straw Ave. So I do think that removing at least one parking space would be helpful to these kinds of things. Thank you. Okay, great, thank you. Okay, any other comments on this? All right, thank you for that. That helps us to um, uh, know what we're taking a look at. Uh, as we move forward. So again, if, if we uh, intend to propose any action on this, it will be after um, outreach is done through the council um, and the mayor's office if appropriate. And, and we would bring a, a, an ordinance back to this committee um, or this commission to, to vote on um, if warranted. So thank you for that. Okay, uh, last thing uh, on our agenda is uh, Freeman Stein appointment to the bike and pedestrian subcommittee. Um, Wayne, not to put you on the spot, but I'm going to. Um, do you want to comment on this or do we need to delay this until next month? Sure. Yeah, I'm happy to. Um, we didn't do a formal request for nominations, but um, Freeman's been very involved with Friends Northampton Trails and Greenway. The person who just left the Bike and Ped Committee was, uh, was from there as well. So it's very nice to to give them a voice at the table. Freeman's also been very involved with um, uh, the wayfinding project we've done in Florence and used to be on the Arts Council. So he's been involved with a lot of areas, but it's particularly the Friends Northampton Trails and Greenways is why we're happy to have him. Okay, so uh, procedurally, um, do we need to vote on this or is it an informal appointment? It's a good question. I mean, it's technically an appointment from the board, so you probably should vote on it. Okay. 
Um, so to uh, members of the commission, do we, um, do we feel comfortable um, voting based off of uh, Wayne's comments or do we wish to um, invite Freeman to be here with us um, to talk to us before taking this up? So I'll just throw that out as a question. So I'm looking for comments from commission members. Councilor Foster, go ahead. So Wayne's recommendation holds a ton of weight with me, um, but I, I, my preference, if it's an option, would be to have uh, Freeman come in and meet with us uh, prior to the commission voting. And I, I should add, we're not in any hurry, so that's certainly fine from my standpoint. Yeah, I would agree. I have no reason not to trust Wayne on this, um, but it's always good to hear from a new member. Okay, anyone else have any comments on this? Um, so there are two hands up from members of the public. So I will uh, recognize you both and ask if you wish to speak on this, which you do. So Brett, go ahead. Thanks. I just want to say that I am a member of the pedestrian and bicycle subcommittee. I would certainly vouch for Freeman Stein. He has, I've had many interactions with, with him and he is a wonderful human being. And I think he'd be a great energetic member of the subcommittee. I do also want to note that I believe there is currently no female members of the subcommittee. Thank you. Thank you, Brett. Okay, and we have one more hand, Lena. Um, thank you. Uh, so I think Brett already mentioned it, but I just wanted to point out that um, there are no uh, women on the subcommittee. Um, so, you know, I don't know Friedman personally, but. Um, it sounds like everyone speaks very highly of him and um, obviously having that connection to Friends of Northampton Trails is incredibly important. Um, so I would also, I think in the last Spike Peg committee, there was also discussion around the number of people who are on that subcommittee. Um, I don't think there's any sort of bylaws that state it has to be a certain number of people. So if we do move forward with this candidacy, which I'm not suggesting that this commission not do, um, I would ask that you all consider expanding the commission so that it can be diversified um, and include other voices um, as it stands right now. It's a all male subcommittee. Thanks. Okay, thank you. So I think we're in agreement that we will invite Freeman to our next meeting to uh, talk to us and, uh, and, and then we will take a vote um, uh, about that appointment. So that will go on our next agenda uh, unless anyone has any further comments on that. Okay, seeing and hearing none, uh, is there any new business? Okay, and before uh, I adjourn, I would just like to congratulate uh, Wayne on the completion of his duties with the Transportation and Parking Commission and uh, join the chorus of voices um, wishing him well in his future endeavors, Councillor Foster. Oh, that was a clap. Oh, <laughs> sorry, I couldn't, uh, couldn't tell the difference. Okay, very good. May, I have, a mo may I have a motion to adjourn, please? So moved. Oh. And a second. Second. Okay. Any discussion? Okay. Beth, please call the roll. Hold on, Beth, you're muted. Thank Donna? You. Yes. Jamie? Yes. Wayne? Yes. Nancy? Yes. Aaron? Yes. Jamila? Yes. Diana? 
Yes. Yes. And then 